Honourable Member for Sandwich Gulf Islands. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm very pleased to take part in today's very important debate. I'm also very proud of our report, the report of the Special Committee on Electoral Reform called Strengthening Democracy in Canada, Principles, Process and Citizen Mobilization for Election Reform. We worked extremely hard to come up with this report. There were 12 members who had a really collegial approach and spirit throughout our work. Together, as I've just said, as a committee of 12 members of Parliament from five parties, a really uniquely put, uh, con comprised committee, and I do commend the former Minister of Electoral Reform and Electoral Institutions, Democratic Institutions, her proper title, uh, current uh, Minister for uh, Status of Women, an Honourable Member for Peterborough, who made the decision that it would be fair to ensure that the Bloc Québécois and the Green Party each participated as full members of the committee. And further, she went further, and this was a step that I never thought that they would take, but conceded to an NDP request that the Liberals give one seat of theirs on the committee to allow the NDP to have two full members. So we were a committee of five Liberals, one of whom served as chair. I have to say our chair did, did a, a superb job. Uh, and a uh, member for um, Saint Laurent, he, he did an extraordinary job. Then there were four voting Liberals, three voting Conservatives, two NDPers, one Bloc and one Green. And we heard from witnesses across Canada. We, we fulfilled our mandate, and I think we fulfilled our mandate admirably. We had between late June and December 1st, when our report was due, more than 60 meetings. We heard from experts, we heard from the leading experts on electoral reform, not only in Canada, but from around the world. Many world leading experts participated by video conference with us. Uh, and we also heard from hundreds, in fact, thousands and tens of thousands of Canadians. That process led to an overwhelming consensus which was that it was time for Canada to move away from first past the post. I want to touch briefly on the substance of the issue before moving to the politics, but the politics are clearly important. On the substance of the issue, we learned in this committee process, I have to say, as someone who's worked on electoral reform for a very long time, far way longer than I've been a member of the Green Party, I've been committed to seeing the end of the first past the post voting system because of its perverse results. Uh, it's clear that it's a voting system that allows the popular vote to diverge from the seat count. That's the easiest way to understand what's wrong with first past the post. The popular vote can say you have a minority parliament, but the seat count can say you have a majority. And democracy isn't well served when the popular vote is not reflected in the seat count. Now, what I did learn, as I said, I've worked on this issue for years, but there's always a lot to learn, and I learned a lot as a member of the Parliamentary Committee on Electoral Reform. For instance, I never knew how it was that Ireland has single transferable vote. Ireland got fair voting because in 1921, when the British Parliament of Westminster decided that Ireland should be allowed its own parliament, they were concerned for the minority rights of Protestants. So they didn't want Ireland to have first past the post. They didn't want Ireland to have the same system Westminster had, so they gave Ireland single transferable vote, a system of proportional representation that works well in Ireland to this day. Well, it had something to do with that decision in Ireland in 1921, that 1921 was the first year in which this parliament, the Parliament of Canada, struck a committee to study our voting system. And that committee in 1921 concluded that first past the post does not work for Canada. That's right, since 1921 we've known this. That was when a committee said, as long as you have a democracy with more than two parties, and Canada since the 1920s has always historically in this place been a multi-party system, that first past the post did not serve Canadian democracy. We worked hard to then decide what would serve Canadian democracy, and that's why this report is so historic. We worked to deliver on the promise of the speech from the throne and of our Prime Minister that 2015 would be the last election held under first past the post. 
We wanted to provide, as we were mandated to do, the answer of what's next. And we concluded that a system of proportional representation was appropriate for Canada, that it could be tailored specifically to Canada's needs, and we specifically precluded the kind of PR used in Israel or Italy. We said, no, we do not recommend a system where you have uh, only lists by party and voters only vote for a party list. We want to maintain that crucial link between a local MP and proportionality at the end of the day. We want the popular vote to be reflected in the seat count, and we want to make sure that members of parliament are elected to represent their constituents and have a local connection. It's important that voters know that. We can have both. And that's what our committee recommended. Our committee also recommended that this be tested by a referendum. Now we're going to have for the first time, and we're having today for the first time, a debate. And I wish more MPs were participating in this debate. This is the first chance we've had as a parliament to really discuss what kind of voting system would work best for Canada. We know that every single Liberal MP in this place was elected on a platform that said we would be moving away from first past the post. And what my plea to them is, don't let the promise fade away. Too much rides on it. For a very, very long time now, Canadians have known that first past the post has this perverse result of separating the seat count from the popular vote. In fact, it's possible, and in fact we have had two times in Canada, of what political scientists call the wrong winner problem. The wrong winner problem is when the party that got the most votes loses the election. It's happened twice in Canada, hasn't happened recently, but it can and does happen under first-past-the-post voting systems. So how do we ensure that the way the popular vote is cast is reflected in the parliament we get, and we still have the advantage of MPs being elected after going door-to-door -door in their own community where people know them? Well, there are a number of solutions. And there are a number of compromises. And this is the only place where I regret how our committee worked together. It comes to this. We ran out of time. We had a hard deadline of give your report in by December 1st. I believe, and I'm firmly committed to this belief, because I knew every single one of those individual 12 MPs, all excellent people. If we'd had more time, if we'd been allowed to work to consensus, if we'd ever had that discussion of, well, what if you give a little here? Is the problem that by 2019 we have full PR? What if we did it incrementally? A bit more fairness in our voting system by 2019, a bit more of the election after that. Would that work for you? We never got to have that discussion of what could work if we compromised. But it's not too late to compromise. By voting for this concurrence motion, and I certainly hope that the Liberal benches will be given a free vote so Liberal MPs can go back to their constituents and tell them they actually voted for what their constituents wanted. We know that the four MPs from PEI, they just had a plebiscite that called for electoral reform in PEI. We know that in British Columbia, 40% of the voters just voted NDP and 17% just voted Green, and that 57% of voters voted for parties once again that called very clearly for getting rid of first past the post. MPs know what their constituents would want them to do on this motion. And what I want to urge people to consider is that in voting for con concurrence, you won't be forcing a referendum to happen. You won't be forcing the government to move to PR. You will be keeping the debate alive and creating that opportunity to find the middle ground. There is middle ground here to be found whether it's having a referendum in 2019 concurrent with the voting day that we have next, whether it's saying we move to a single transferable vote system as our former chief electoral officer, Jean-Pierre Kingsley, recommended, that we cluster those ridings in the vast areas of Canada where that works and exclude those areas that are remote or where the ridings are too large, or if we move to the Fair Vote Canada approach, of one set of voting rules that work for rural Canadians and another set that work for where we're more concentrated in our ridings. There are compromises here that can be found. What is unacceptable is to break the promise and leave it broken. That will break people's faith with democracy itself. Young people who voted for the first time 
and believe the Prime Minister's promise, and I frankly believe he fully intended to keep it when he made it, and it will be better for the health of democracy if we work to allow that promise to be kept. This is the time to keep that promise. Please vote in favor of this motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? The Honorable Member for Marcorel Fortin. I'd like to congratulate our colleague for Saanich Gulf Islands. We see through her comments that she took part, along with uh, the other members of the committee, who traveled across Canada, and I think her contribution was extremely positive. Now, when you talk about referenda, I'd like to know a little more, because we're talking about modernizing our way of working here in this assembly. But a referendum, I don't really understand where you're going with that or your comments. The Honourable Member for Sandwich Gulf Islands, I thank my colleague for his question. It's quite clear that there are referenda that work well, but there are others that are disasters. That is always a question of the level of comprehension and knowledge of the citizenship before the referendum. In Canadian history, uh, federally we had one on, circum uh, on uh, conscription uh, in the war, we had one on prohibition, we had one on Charlottetown. If we were to hold a referendum, we need to rewrite our referendum act. Our current referendum act uh, does not allow for the question of electoral reform to be put to a referendum. It's clear from the British North America Act, as it was written in 1867, 150 years ago, that the question of our voting system is squarely one for the Parliament to decide. But a lot, there's a strong view of public opinion, there's a strong view of some of the parties in this place that if we're changing our voting system, it should be put to a referendum. I mentioned that PEI just had one, and the people of PEI voted overwhelmingly for mixed member proportional voting systems and for getting rid of first past the post. We had a referendum in British Columbia on single transferable vote. 57% of British Columbians voted for that, but they'd set the threshold at 60. A lot depends on the level of public information available before the vote. Questions and comments? I say come on file. The Honourable Member for Nanaimo, Lady Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm so glad that this House agreed to the New Democrat motion to formulate the Committee on Electoral Reform that would include the Bloc and Green members for the first time. Um, and I'm very grateful for the uh, continued uh, iteration of what happens when we have many parties represented and have cooperation. And this uh, Electoral Reform Committee report is an expression of that. Um, it also, along with yesterday's news about the agreement in British Columbia around uh, potential cooperation of two parties to work together and hold government in British Columbia, the looking at all the examples around the world about what happens when many parties cooperate together, uh, that their parliaments and legislatures uh, develop policies that are more lasting and do not have extreme swings of ideology from one election to the next. So. I, uh, I would like to know uh, about uh, the member from Saanich Gulf Islands a degree of, of optimism. I understand that we only need 20 members of parliament from the Liberal Party to agree to this concurrence motion that we do keep the discussion around electoral reform alive. It's an opportunity for these MPs to keep their promise, which has been broken by their Prime Minister. Um, I'd, I'd like to hear whether uh, my uh, fellow member of parliament uh, um, is, is hopeful that uh, tomorrow's vote might result in a, in a keeping of the promise by at least some of the Liberal members of parliament. Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As ever, my optimism on any issue of fundamental democratic reform uh, increases in direct proportion to the nonpartisan nature of the debate. If we use this as an excuse to beat up on the Prime Minister for breaking a promise, we will not succeed. If we use this as an opportunity to focus the Prime Minister's attention on the possibilities that are still there for him to keep his promise. If we urge Liberals to vote for what we think is in the best interest of democracy, I'm quite optimistic, particularly if 
It's not a whipped vote. If Liberal MPs are allowed to vote how they believe their constituents would like them to vote, and if it's taken, if, if the debate is taking place, and I, I thank my colleague uh, for Nanaimo Lady Smith for giving me this chance to, to put, to, to reframe my main point, which is we can still salvage this promise in a way that meets the needs of government and opposition parties. We can do it together. If we, if we check our, our partisanship at the door and think about what's best for Canada. The risk for Canada, please consider this, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, we don't know when it might be. Somebody who represents a Canadian version of Trump, and don't think it can happen, seizes 100% of the power over our country with a minority of popular support. There's always the risk of someone extreme seizing power with majority support, that's a democracy. But our system of government is extraordinarily vulnerable because the Prime Minister of Canada has more power relative to our government than the President of the United States or the Prime Minister of the UK. We must check that exercise of power by ensuring it's never vested in any party or individual that does not have the support of the majority of Canadians before they get 100% of the power. It's a matter of protecting our democracy in the future by voting yes tomorrow. Questions and comments? Question and comment, uh, the Honourable Member for, the Honourable Member for uh, Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, I have to take an exception to one thing my Honourable colleague just said. I, I personally do not believe that any political system any electoral system has the effect of privileging extremism or diminishing extremism. It's, it's been an unfortunate aspect of this debate that the Prime Minister has asserted that proportionality would lead to uh, greater power being exercised by extremists who would hold the balance of power potentially in some, uh, in some future government and be able to get disproportionate influence. And my colleague from the Green Party is now making the opposite assertion that uh, that, that first past the post does this. Uh, the fact is that um, we've seen proportionality, pure proportionality, used uh, to terrible effect uh, in Germany, where that was the system under which Hitler was elected. And yet, it does not has not discredited proportionality in other countries, including Israel, the Netherlands, and so on. The same thing is true for, for first past the post, and I suggest for any system. You know, we, we need to discuss these things with the goal to trying to improve our system as much as we can. But I actually don't think it's helpful to suggest that any system that is going to be seriously considered in this country, including the status quo, uh, actually uh, privileges extremism. We are an inherently moderate country. We have more than a century of inherent moderatism. I su suggest to you that our future will be moderate and intelligent as well, as well, long as we are moderate in our rhetoric as well. Thank you. Here, here. Or Saanich Gulf Islands. I appreciate the chance to respond to my friend from Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston, and I want to thank him once again for his superb contribution to our work on the committee. Uh, he's misunderstood my point. I did not say that first past the post privileged extremism. I am saying that Canada is uniquely vulnerable to a uh, extremist or un unpopular, if you will, uh, leader of a party gaining a hundred percent of the power with a minority of the votes. It's only under first past the post that you can have a party with potentially 25% of the popular vote getting all the power because of the way our executive and legislative are not separated as they are in the US. And because as we know, the Prime Minister of Canada is not subject to caucus confidence, which can remove the leader of the party and thus change the Prime Minister. So our system, and I, we have numerous authorities on this from academics, whether Peter Russell or, or uh, the, uh, Denis, Sa Denis Savoie, we have lots of experts who've pointed out the Prime Minister of Canada, relatively speaking, has more power than other leaders of other governments. And the reality is no one should hold that office with a majority unless they are supported by the majority of the voters. That's why we have to get rid of first past the post. Time for one more uh, short question and response. The Honourable Member for uh, Vancouver East. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank uh, the member for her uh, comments. I think fundamental to this issue is really an issue of trust in a democratic system. A lot of young people went to the election believing that this is going to materialize. That being first past the post would be the last electoral system that we would embark on for, uh, for the election. So going forward, we would have something different. 
So now what I'm worried about, if this motion doesn't pass, and I hope it will, and this is an opportunity for all members of the House to reflect on that uh, and to pass this motion to change course so that we can restore faith or to ensure that the faith of the young people and the Canadians who voted for change, that they would actually have that change. So I wonder if uh, the member can comment on that, about the demo democratic system and the faith to which the electorate had placed on us and to restore, I think, the work that we need to do to demonstrate democracy is, in fact, fundamental to the promises that we make. Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Well, I thank my friend from Vancouver East. Clearly, no one would debate or dispute that our democracy is threatened by cynicism, that those who give up on voting are a tremendous loss to the health of our democracy. And in fact, when you have low voter turnout, you increasingly lose the legitimacy of government and you lose the empowerment of a society to actually choose their own course. We're a democracy, we should be getting 90% plus voter turnout. We were pleased to see it go to 68% last time. I believe the reason we saw it go to 68% in 2015 was largely based on young people voting for the first time, young people who believe this promise, young people who will become increasingly cynical and angry and maybe not vote again if we don't work hard in this place to find some common political ground to deliver on that promise, either partially, fully, with a promise for before the next election, one way or another, this promise for fair democracy and fair voting must be kept alive.